Hello, respective viewers. I'm standing outside the house of perhaps the most distinguished Irish soldier of all time, uh, Herbert Kitchener, who uh, was born in Kerry uh, in 1850, born to uh, English parents. Now, he left Ireland as an infant, and uh, so far as I'm aware, he never returned. So he can be regarded as Irish or English or both. I, I think both, why not? Um, anyway, uh, so he uh, grew up in England. He went to um, an independent school. There were well, almost no state schools, a not terribly distinguished one. Um, his family was solidly middle class, but they, they didn't have great aristocratic connections. And he went up to the uh, Royal um, uh, Military Academy to train to be an army officer. Um, it had been founded only, only very shortly before, partly after some of the um, fiascos of the uh, Crimean War. The uh, British government decided that uh, the British Army needed a proper academy to train all army officers. They they'd already, ha already had Woolwich, but then opened Sandhurst. No more purchasing commissions, because occasionally a poltroon would get himself um, a command of many thousands of soldiers, and you can imagine what uh, disastrous consequences could ensue. Anyhow, so um, Kitchener, he achieved rapid promotion. He was known for his diligence, his, his gallantry, and he served in many different theatres. Where he really rose to fame was Sudan. And remember, then it was actually part of Egypt. And Egypt was at least nominally part of the Ottoman Empire until, until 1914. Though the British Army had been there since ooh, 1881, if, um, if memory serves. So, anyway, there had been the Mahdiist revolt in, in um, Sudan. The Sudanese were um, mostly Sunni Muslims, like the um, Egyptians. Um, there were very few Christians or animists in the extreme south of Sudan. And indeed, the Egyptians had conquered all through Sudan and gone all the way down into Uganda. Uh, they called it Equatoria back then, but had almost no control, rapidly lost control of Uganda. But anyway, this, uh, this guy called himself the Mahdi, claimed he was the reincarnation of the Prophet Muhammad, peace um, and blessings upon him. And um, he rebelled against Egyptian rule. And uh, I say Egyptian, but many people working for the Egyptians were Sudanese. There was no clear distinction between who was Egyptian and who was Sudanese in those days. And obviously the official language used was Arabic but a lot of Sudanese couldn't speak Arabic, even if they were Muslim. So um, anyway, um, General Gordon was there. So Chinese Gordon, as he was known, was um, famously uh, killed in 1885. And Gladstone got it in the neck for that. The grand old man Gladstone was known as Murder of Gordon. So G-O-M became M-O-G. But anyway, um, then in coordination with the Egyptians, we decided they were gonna defeat the Mahdiist revolt. And so Mahdi had died very shortly after the death of Gordon, but he'd appointed his Khalifa, or successor, and the Khalifa ruled on till 1898. So um, uh, he was never one to do things by half measures, Kitchener, and he realized that, um, that defeating the Mahdists was a major undertaking and required the construction of a canal, as well as using the, not canals, sorry, a railway, as well as using the, the River Nile to transport troops and munitions. So anyway, they got down to Omdurman, which was um, just across the River Nile from Khartoum, Khartoum being the capital of, of, um, of Sudan. It means um, uh, trunk, as an elephant's trunk in the Arabic language. So the Blue Nile and the White Nile meet, uh, and Arabic poetry dubs the Nile from there on down to the Mediterranean, the longest uh, kiss in history. But um, so it's a very significant city for all sorts of reasons. Anyway, so British and Egyptian troops made it there. There'd already been some fighting near the coast of Sudan, and um, the military technology was very much on the British side, having Maxim guns and so on, uh, and forming squares so that Mahdiist dervishes, as they called them, couldn't, couldn't, um, sur couldn't well, attack them from the flank. There was no flank, in a sense. And that was that, and really just firepower told. They were outnumbered by the Mahdiists at least three to one, but the, the British technolog technological advantage prevailed. Of course, there were some Sudanese tribes who were pro-British, friendlies they were known as, and the Mahdists were given short shrift. So the Khalifa, he, he commanded his troops, he led from the front, and he and some of his commanders sat down on chairs on the battlefield to show their disdain for death. They, they were not going to flee. And anyway, so the Khalifa and some of his top commanders were killed, and that was that. So they'd got to, to across the river to Khartoum, and there was a mausoleum of, of, of uh, the Mahdi, and um, uh, Kitchener ordered it to be demolished. I have a feeling that the Mahdi skull was taken as well. He didn't want it to be a place of pilgrimage for anyone else who tried to revive that cult. Of course, by mainstream Islam, Mahdi was, was um, an apostate, or should I say a blasphemer, falsely claiming to be the Prophet Muhammad. But there is some bitterness about his defeat even now. <laughs> the majority of the Muslim world actually thanked um, Kitchener for what he'd done. Remember, the Ottoman Empire was going strong back then, fairly strong, and the UK had a good relationship with the Ottoman Sultan. 
um, and the idea was that uh, he would tell Muslims in the British Empire to be loyal to the British and in return the United Kingdom would support the Ottoman Empire. Um, don't forget the majority of subjects of the British Empire were Muslim. Okay, you take so many of the, the African colonies had Muslim majorities. Um, India had a large Muslim minority because it then included Pakistan and Bangladesh. Malaya and so on had a Muslim majority. So there were more Muslims than were Hindus or Christians or anyone else. Um, so that was Kitchener. He never married. He said he'd wish he'd be born, be born a eunuch, a very forbidding and austere figure. So the young Winston Churchill was there at that battle and took place in one of the last successful, successful cavalry charges in British history there in 1898. And his shoulder became dislocated, as often happened to him. You can read about it in um, The River War by, by Churchill. And uh, he claims that uh, some wounded um, dervishes, as they say, Mahdi's uh, fighters, were, were, were killed on the spot. That could be the coup de grace if, they're, if they were already fatally wounded, or was it murder, as in they could be saved and they were just finished off. Some of them supposedly were playing dead and then attacking the, attacking the British and Egyptian soldiers. So you can also read about it in Churchill's My, My, My Early Life, in which he describes this battle and he remarks how easy it is to kill a man. Felt no remorse about that. Anyway, then there was a South African conflict, 1899 to 1902, and Kitchener had to go out to, to oversee that one. Uh, he always had the most withering disdain for politicians and disliked the way some of them weren't willing to negotiate or want to fight to the utmost. So how to defeat the, um, the, the um, Afrikaners who were fighting um, as guerrillas? He set up block houses, had long barbed wire fences to hem them in, restrict their freedom of movement, cut off their supplies of food, munitions, and indeed intelligence in turning a lot of the civilian population. So that was that. It was, a, it was a, another victory for him, but it wasn't a very quick or de uh, decisive or glorious one. And again, a lot of people felt rancorous about the um, uh, Boer civilians uh, who died of inner sanitation when they were detained. So what was the next thing about, uh, about Kitchener? Obviously fighting in the First World War. Um, he didn't like uh, militias, part-time soldiers. He wanted any professional soldiers. The United Kingdom was one of the only countries in Europe not to have compulsory military service. But the UVF was founded in January 1913, and the First World War broke out, and he needed every man he could get, so he famously telegraphed to Belfast, send me the Ulster Volunteers. And so many of the UVF joined uh, various regiments of the British Army, PALS battalions. If you joined a group, you could stay as a group. That made it more appealing to join, rather than being put in a unit with complete strangers. The trouble is, if there was heavy casualties for one unit, it's going to really affect one part of the country. So then he, um, so they were put together as the 16th, uh, sorry, as the 36th Ulster um, Division. Um, anyway, another thing he had to look into was, was the Dardanelles campaign, Churchill's brainchild of um, uh, trying to get through the Dardanelles onto the Bosphorus and the water that flows to the middle of Istanbul. And the Royal Navy could just threaten the uh, Ottomans to either pull out of the war or their capital is going to be flattened by the Royal Navy. But anyway, the best laid plans of mice and men go, gang off to awry. And this one didn't work. And pretty soon they were bogged down in the um, Battle of Gallipoli. Um, French, Indian, British, Australian, New Zealand troops. And uh, Kitchener was not in charge of that operation. We were sent out to assess the situation. And so um, in the summer of 1915, he said, well, the thing is, it's hopeless, and we're just going to pull out, which politicians really didn't want to hear. They felt it was a huge lot of loss of face. This myth of British invincibility would be broken in the Middle East. But anyway, his, his plan was put into operation, and at least the, the evacuation was very successful. Not a single man was killed in the evacuation, which is more impressive than you might, than you might think, because there were tens of thousands of men leaving at night, as far as possible, silently, with loaded weapons. They were going to accidentally shoot each other or something like that, but no, no, no man got killed leaving. So then in 1916, he was going by HMS Hampshire to, to have consultations with the Russians, but um, his ship struck a German mine in the sea some way north of Britain, and the, the ship went down with all hands. His remains have never been recovered. There's a memorial to him in, uh, in um, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. So he had no children. As he said, he'd wished he'd been born a eunuch. And he's the one who knows those first of all recruiting posters with that um, rather splendid moustache uh, saying, I, I want you, or Britain wants you, finger right in the middle of you. So that is enough about Lord Kitchener of Khartoum.